we are excited about today. I'm excited about today. If you have your Bibles, 2 Corinthians 3 is where we're going to go. So there's the New Testament. It starts with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Gospels, their perspectives on the life of Jesus, written by apostles. And then there's the book of Acts. This is the only inspired book of church history. This is where we, we understand uh, how the church started with Jesus' resurrection and then how it goes forward. And then there's the book of Romans, which is this amazing treatise by, uh, by, by, by the Apostle Paul that, that studied in terms of uh, this legal argument about how we have been lost in sin and then we have been justified by grace through faith in Jesus. And, and, and then we get into this, book, this, this two little series book to the Corinthians. The Corinthians were, uh, oh, how do you say it? Like, uh, they were the church gone wild, man. They, they, they struggled. They were messed up people. They, 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 they had a hard time figuring out what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to live. Uh, 1 Corinthians is all about, Paul's just, Paul's kind of like, just, you know, th- does your dad, you ever have a, you have a dad and, and maybe he's just, you know, he gets upset and he just like starts telling you, do this, do this, do this. That's 1 Corinthians. Paul's just upset. He's, he's breaking down the gospel for him and then saying, you are out of step with it in all of these ways. And 2 Corinthians is this beautiful book of like, of, of, of hope, of, of joy, of getting to see correction and still things to be corrected, but, but getting to see this gospel-centered correction occur. And that's where we're going to be today. Um, but first I want to, I want to start. I, I've, uh, so I came to know the Lord on December 30th, 1997. I was 16, a week before I turned 17, and I understood something about my, myself at that, that day, in that moment, at that time, and that was that if I were to die, I would die and go to hell. Here's what, here's what I understood. I was on a uh, winter retreat. I'm from Michigan. Anybody from Michigan? I'm always wondering. When I speak, I always ask, anybody from Michigan? Besides my parents. My parents go to here. They were from Michigan, too. Um, <laughs> Uh, what we do is we, we, we take our right hand out. If you ever meet anybody from Michigan, this is what they'll do if, if they see another person from Michigan. They'll take their right hand out, and they'll point where, where they are from Michigan. Because if you don't know this, Michigan looks like a mitten. Did you know that? You're from Texas, so you're pretty Texas-centric. Um, so so you, you, right? It's a nation, right? One nation under Texas. Yeah, I guess, right? <laughs> I feel like that was mildly blasphemous. Okay, um, so here, so I'm from right here, uh, and what happens in Michigan uh, is in the winter, it gets cold. Now, what you think is cold is 45 degrees, right? And the rain, it like hits you a little bit, and you're like, ooh, that's chilly. Uh, and sometimes you think it's cold. In Michigan, there's this thing, it's called snow. <laughs> and what it is, it is, it's frozen water that comes from the sky, Okay. Are you, are, have you ever, have you heard of this before? Maybe you've gone skiing, that, that, that it exists. And so we, we are, we're driving to our winter retreat spot, and it's going to be in a kind of a mountain, a mountain for Michigan, and, and we're going to, we're going to be there. And on the way there, uh, our driver, um, 62-year-old man, is struggling a little bit with the, with the storm that's going on, and, uh, and the snow and the ice, and I start to have this, like, intense fear, like, Okay, we could die. And then, like, I started to ask those questions. Like, do I know the Lord? I mean, we've, I grew up in church. Like, uh, you know, my mom played the organ at our church growing up. My dad was a deacon. I, you know, I came out of the womb, and they spanked me, and I said, Jesus. And that's what happened, right? <laughs> and, and so I, I go, I mean, I'm in church the day, for, you know, a couple weeks later after I'm born, and there we are. Um, and my grandparents went to that same church. We, you know, that was our, we grew up, I grew up in church. Um, but just, I, I learned how to play the game, you know? So I would go and I knew the Bible really well. Like I, I, you know, I knew verses and stuff and stories. And when the teacher messed up, I could tell the teacher how they did it wrong. Uh, I memorized the 10 commandments when I was like seven. And then the teacher messed up and I corrected him. Uh, and, 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 I was a jerk kid, right? Uh, and, and, and I knew the stuff. And I could tell you about Jesus, everything about Jesus. I knew about church. I, I, I knew the whole, 
deal. And I was lost, like just lost. And when I get, when I get to junior high and, and into high school, something started to develop in me. Um, and, and, like, and it coincided with the time that this, uh, that, that when Al Gore invented the internet, right? And I'm being facetious there. And, and, uh, I, I started to develop this, uh, this addiction to, to pornography when I was 14, 15, and 16. And this, this thing just started to take over my heart, my mind, my life. And, and that's what I started to, to, to live in. And, and so when I'm driving on this road with this 62-year-old man in the middle of the snow and ice on a mountain up, up into Michigan where I'm going on a retreat, and I start to fear for my life because he's a bad driver, then I start to fear for my soul because I am really painfully aware of my sin. And we make it there by the grace of God. And I get down and I, I literally do this. I kiss the ground. Um, and then we had our first worship service that day, and I went forward when they gave this invitation. I don't even know what the man talked about, but I know that I needed Jesus, and I was going to die and go to hell if I didn't have him. And so I went forward and gave my life to Jesus that day. And, and, and I confessed I was a sinner because I knew in this big macro way, hey, I am a sinner, and I am going to die and go to hell if I don't have a Savior. I need Jesus. And so that day, I gave my life to Jesus, trusted Jesus, came home. I, I was baptized a little bit after that and, and, and started to walk forward. And here's what I did. I, I, you know, while I knew all the stories of Jesus and knew this scripture and knew all the stuff about Jesus, what I ended up doing uh, was I started to think, like, what I need to do is, is I need to do a lot of good stuff. So I need to, number one, I got to stop sinning. That's, Christians need to stop sinning. Like, that Christians just... You just quit, like you get saved, and then there's no more sinning ever. And, and, and so I got to do that. And then I've, I'm supposed, you know, you're supposed to as a believer, you're supposed to read the Bible. Like there was this, all this talk of quiet times. And I was like, I'm a, I'm a 16-year-old boy. Quiet is really hard, uh, but uh, so I'm supposed to be quiet. So there's supposed to be quiet time, read my Bible, and then I'm supposed to pray. And so there's like stop sinning, quiet time, prayer, yes, and, and then do good things and and. So I tried it. So I, w- I would try to do all those things at once. And what I would do is I, w- I would kind of like grip it really hard. Like, all right, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to sin anymore. And I'd, I'd play these silly games. I don't know if you ever played these games. Maybe you're playing one right now where like you're, you're uh, I'm not going to lie today. I'm not going to lie today. Not going to lie. Not going to lie. Not going to lie. Not going to lie. And I made it 24 hours not lying. And then I lied. And then this massive wave of guilt all over. Like, okay, <sighs> all right, I'm a failure. Or, or, I mean, the one I struggled with most with was just lust. Like, like you're, you're, seven, you're 17, and I'm like, all right, I'm not, not going not gonna to think that way. I'm not going to think of women as objects. I'm going to think of them as people. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to grip. Women are people. They aren't objects. Women are people, not objects. Women are people, not objects. And then I fail again, and this massive wave of guilt floods over my soul again. And after a series of months where I am trying hard not to sin and to do the right stuff, I went to my youth pastor and just said, I want to quit being a Christian is too hard. Like, I can't, I can't do this. I, I, I can't, I can't muscle it, right? I, like, I, I can't, I can't hold on tight enough to it. I, I, I can't do the best stuff and get the stuff done the right way. And he pointed me to 2 Corinthians 3. And just said, you need to spend some time reading this. I was like, whatever. And I don't think it's going to be on the screen. The, the, this verse got me, and then another verse in a second. And, and, and here's the verse that got me. Not that we 
This is verse 5, 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we, so people, are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. So I looked up some words. So I looked up the word sufficient. What does sufficient mean? And it means able. And, and, it, and, and I started to find, like, this guy. So I got this. The Apostle Paul, he, he's, he planted churches everywhere, wrote most of the New Testament. I, and I got that because I knew the facts when I was a kid. So I grew up knowing facts. I know what Paul did. This is who Paul is. And Paul says, who's planted churches everywhere and done everything, first missionary, amazing guy, done all this stuff. He says, I'm not able. And I was like, okay. Me either. Okay. Not that I am sufficient in myself. So I'm not able. He says he's not able. Okay, so maybe there's hope for me. Maybe I don't want to quit this thing because, like, I like this idea of heaven and not hell, but, and I don't want to quit. So what do I do? And, 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 and he said, it keeps on going, not that I, you're sufficient of yourselves to think anything is coming from yourselves, but our sufficiency, our ability is of Christ. And something started to click, like, like this. Uh, instead of a wave of despair, this 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 feeling of hope started to rise. Like, like maybe I'm not supposed to do it. Maybe I'm not supposed to be the one who's who's pushing it together and making it happen. Maybe I don't have to like stop sinning and read my Bible and pray and because I was really bad at reading and I had a hard time focusing on prayer and, and like I maybe maybe I just maybe I wasn't supposed to like just grip that stuff and make it happen. Maybe what I was supposed to do was something different. Maybe it wasn't supposed to be about what I was doing, but about something else. Maybe it's supposed to be about someone that I was supposed to look at. And I got to 2 Corinthians 3, and I just kept reading it, and, and it got down to verse 18. This is, this is going to be what we, what we focus on today, and it goes like this. Well, actually, no, we'll do 18. It says, and we all. So, so it's Paul, and he's talking, about, he's talking about people, believers. He says, we all with unveiled face. So, so the, this thing, that, that unveiled face thing, if you were to look back a little bit in this, in this chapter, what you're going to see is, is it, it's, the big idea is talking about Moses. And Moses, what, what, what he did is he went, he, he led the people, led Israel out of Egypt in slavery in the Old Testament in Exodus. He leads them out. And as he leads them out, they, they go through the Red Sea like it divides and they walk through it. And we believe that that happened. And he walks through it. And then he goes up to a mountain, Mount Sinai. And there he, he's getting the law. And while he's in the presence of God receiving the law, he, like he's there, he's getting it, and he comes down the mountain. And when he comes down the mountain, it says that his, his, his face, his countenance shone. Like it was, it was bright. And the people couldn't stand to look at him because he had been in the presence of God. So, so th th this is who Moses is. And, and so when it says unveiled face, he, he, he's saying, we, we all, we, we've got this face and, and we don't have to veil anymore. We get to be right in front of him. We all with unveiled face. Beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So we, 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 we don't have this veil anymore. We can look at the Lord. We, we look at him. We see him. We get him. We understand him. We follow him. We trust him. And, and we all with unveiled face, we behold the glory of the Lord. We, we are, let me break that down for you. L look at me. We, we, we look at Jesus. We all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord. We, 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 we are looking at Jesus. And then, like, it started to click for me. Like, I have a relationship with God through Jesus. I have heaven as my home and not hell. Beautiful. 
And, and it started to make sense that maybe the way that I, that I change, maybe the way that I grow, maybe the way that I proceed in this race that's set before me, maybe the way I do that is by looking at Jesus. And it's not about gripping. It's, it's, not about, it's not about stopping something. It's not about making myself read my... It's not, it's not about that. Maybe it's about me looking at Jesus. And maybe, just maybe, maybe, when I say maybe over and over again, that means definitely. What, what, what I mean is, is, is that definitely... The same way that we are saved from hell is the same way that we grow as believers. And that maybe the same gospel that saves us is the same gospel that sanctifies us. And maybe the thing, maybe the thing where we say, I I put my faith and trust in you to to take me from hell and, and let me go to heaven. Maybe that thing is the same way that I grow as a believer. And, and, and in that thing, that's how I live. And if I live that way, if I focus on Jesus, you know what happens? I stop sinning. Like, I'm not sinless, speedily perfect. Like, don't hear that. That's garbage, okay? But the desire to do that melts away. And I found myself, like, talking to God, not because I had to, but because, this sounds so churchy, but it's true, but because I got to. Because it was this subtle shift from, I'm going to do, to I'm going to be. And I get to be in Christ. I get to rest in Christ. I don't have to be spending my time spinning my wheels, pulling all together, white knuckling it to try to make it happen. I just needed to focus on Jesus and it happened. We all with unveiled face behold the glory of the Lord are being transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to the next. Because here's the thing, it says one degree to the next degree, one degree to the next degree. You focus on Jesus, and here's the thing. You're going to start to transform. Things are going to change, but slow. I've heard it said like this. Your spirituality is marinated, not microwaved. You, you, you put your life in Christ, and, and it marinates. <coughs> and that flavor gets infused. I had some great brisket last night. It was really good. It was fantastic, right? We, we had a little fantasy football draft, and that brisket was fantastic. Good stuff. Delightful. And it only happens low and slow. That, that's the way you got to do that stuff. You can't microwave brisket and expect it to taste good, right? <laughs> this is a thing I learned in Michigan. Like, you, 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 it takes time. Your walking with Jesus takes time. You're living a gospel-centered life is a process. Let me say it like this. And here's your first hand, here's your first uh, fill in the blank on your handout. So we're 15 minutes into the message and first blank. Ready? Just plan like that. Here, gospel-centered lives are focused on Jesus in the macro and the micro. So in the, I need to get out of hell, and I want to go to heaven. That, I've heard a lot of people, they like down that thing, like, hey, we don't want to just save people from hell and, and whatever. No, no, that's a very real thing that draws people to Jesus. Like, they, people need to know that there's a real hell, there's a real heaven, and Jesus saves you from that based on his death on a cross and your sin being, you, you giving that up and saying, I'm a sinner, and Jesus saying, I'm going to save you, here it is. That's real. So I don't want to minimize that. But it's also the micro. 
like every moment of the day that you have, the way that you grow, the way that you overcome sin, the way that that you live a life focused on the gospel is by looking at Jesus. Gospel-centered lives are focused on Jesus in the macro and the micro, in the big and the little. In the big, I want to get out of hell. In the little, my kid has been talking at me since 5 a.m. They've asked for the same thing since 5 a.m. My wife does this. My husband does that. It's taking the gospel and plugging it into every aspect. And the way you do that is by focusing on Jesus. Because look at the next blank. Focusing on Jesus is the only way to true transformation. It's not a checklist of stuff to do that's going to make you better doesn't matter how much will you put into it and how hard you try and how much, you know, how much strength you think you have. Because, you know, here's the thing. If you say, let's take the sin thing for a second. We'll put it over here. And we say, okay, I'm not going to lie. 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 I'm not going to steal. 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 I'm going to honor my parents. I'm going to honor my parents. I'm going to honor my parents. And, and you just say, I'm not going to do these things. I'm not going to break these laws. You know, the top 10, right? I'm not going to break those. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it. I'm not doing it. Then what commandment have you broken? First one, because you're making yourself your God. Remember what God, the first thing he says is, you'll have no other gods before me. And if you're the one white-knuckling it, I'm not doing 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 it, then you're a Pharisee. It's only by Jesus. It's only through focusing on him that you are truly transformed. This is how... Christianity in general has essentially become what, what, what a researcher at Notre Dame says is, is he calls it moralistic therapeutic deism. So what a lot of times what Christianity has become in America, okay, is, is, is we want to be better morally. So, so we, you know, we, we, are, we are definitely pro-life at City View. D- hear nothing else but that. We are pro-life here. We love babies out of the womb and in the womb. We love them. Yeah, we love that. But here's the thing, and we love it based on the gospel. But there's a, there, there can be a subtle shift where we're like, we're going to do the morally right thing, and, and we're, we're just going to, we're just going to love pro-life for the sake of loving pro-life. And, 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 and this is what we're going to do. And then we're, we're also, we're, we're going to vote Republican, because that's what, that's what good Christians do, right? <laughs> we vote Republican. Like, we listen to Sean Hannity and we vote Republican. <laughs> and, 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 and somehow we, we stray from this like we love babies in and out of the womb because, of, because they bear the image of God. We, we, we shift from this gospel understanding of, of, of humanity to, hey, this is my political stance and this is where I'm going to be. And so I'm, I'm morally correct. Now, let me say this. That's, that's who I am. Like, I, I'm, I'm conservative in my, in my voting. That, that, that's who I'm going to go after. That, that's who I go for. That, that's me. But if I do that without the gospel being the center part of it, then all it is is mor- moralism. Do you guys understand? I'm, I'm probably offending people. I'm going to get some emails later. This moralistic, it's not about being good. Because you're not. You're a sinner. Like, in your soul, in the depth of your heart, that's who you are. And the gospel changes you, not taking politically correct stands. Therapeutic. Like, we, we, you know, we, we want God to, you know, he's going to make us feel good. He's, 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 he's going he's gonna to make us feel good about ourselves. And, and, and you know, I'm going to look at, you know, 
the Bible, and then I'm also going to go and check out Deepak Chopra. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get all the self-help I can over here, and I, you know, because it's the largest book, it's the largest section in every bookstore, right? There's a million self-help books because everybody feels like my I got to get help. But Christians, hey, it's not about feeling good about yourself. It's about realizing that you aren't good, and Jesus is good. And God sees you as good, not because of you, but because of Jesus. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. Like, this is what a lot of our founding fathers had. And so this is why when people say, like, hey, we're we're a nation that, you know, we're a Christian nation. I think there are Christian principles that we were founded on, definitely. Don't, Don't hear anything else but that. But most of those founding fathers, they were deists. So, like, they, they thought, hey, we're, we're going to want, God wound up the world, started it, and go. So we believe there's a God, but he's just going to let us go after it the way we want to go after it. And so this is the way American Christianity has uh, cycled down towards moralistic, therapeutic deism, not gospel-centered Christianity, not 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 lives and churches that are that are centered around who Jesus is and what he's done. The gospel is the thing that transforms us. And when we focus on Jesus, when we look at him, it's the only way of true transformation. Hebrews 12, let us lay aside the sin that so easily besets us and, and, and let us run with, with, with endurance the race that is set before us. How do we run that race? We run it looking unto Jesus. <laughs> That'd be awesome if it happened again. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. How do you run the race? Not by being really good. You run the race because you look at the finish line. You look at Jesus. How do you live this life? You live this life looking at Jesus. How do, I, how do I grow as a believer? You grow by looking at Jesus. Here's the thing about gospel-centered Christianity. Look at Jesus. How do I grow? How do I transform? How does, that, how does it come together? What do I do? What am I supposed to do? You look at Jesus. You look at him, and everything changes. Now, now I'm aware of uh, sometimes what we need is a little little help understanding what looking at Jesus looks like. Does that make sense? So, so Jason, great. That's very general. Thank you for the general, Jason, so that I can see it in, in the broad perspective and say, okay, how do I live this life? In the, I, got, I always got to come back to Jesus. So gospel-centered Christianity, it's not about I got to share the gospel every second of every day. It's about looking at Jesus. I get that. Okay, very cool. So I get, I get this. That, that's where I need to focus. I focus on Jesus. All right, but how do, I, how do I know if that's happening? What we've developed is uh, we, we call it six Gs, and what they are, these are, these are touchstones. Do you know what ch- touchstones are? Um, they're not a checklist. Okay, a checklist is, am I, you know, this was like the old Baptist thing. Like, you know, did you read your Bible this week? Check. Did you, did you go to church? Check. Did you go to Sunday school? Check. Did you go to RAs, whatever that thing is? Check. Did, did you do Awana? Check. And, and it was this checklist of stuff that you're supposed to do. And if you did, then, well, we, we've got fully devoted followers of Jesus. Yeah. Well, they were just showing up at stuff. The, these are touchstones. What a touchstone is, is uh, it, it was used um, when, during gold rush days and stuff like that, where, where they would take a stone, and, and, uh, and dating back to, to ancient Greece, and they would take this stone, usually a black stone of, uh, I'm sorry, I forget the, the type of stone, and, and, and they would take this metal that they thought to be precious, and what they would do is they would rub it on the stone, if the metal left a line, then that metal was genuine. If the metal did not leave a line, then that metal was not genuine. You're, you're thinking, well, I'm just going to scrape it really hard till there's a line. Didn't work that way. 
So that's a touchstone. So we've developed six touchstones, not a checklist. Can I just, I just want to be so abundantly clear, this is not a checklist. This is not, hey, Jason said I just need to do these six things and I'm good. These are six touchstones so that you take your life, you rub them against these six things, and you see, am I living gospel-centered or not? So here they are. Ready? Number one, gospel. Ooh. G, gospel. Good job. I bet one of them is God, Jason. You'd be wrong. <laughs> Here's the question. Am I leaning on the gospel for my salvation? And have I publicly demonstrated it through baptism? Gospel. Am I leaning on the gospel for my salvation? And have I publicly demonstrated it through baptism? You take your life and say, have I trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Am I really a believer? Have I done that? Here's this question. And then there's this next step. And, and you know, we're Baptists, so we, we, baptism's important. But baptism shows publicly what's, what God's done inwardly. So I, I, when I'm explaining to kids and students, I say it like this, is that baptism is the outward show of the inward go. So if God has changed you inside, then you just show it outside. And then people get like freaked out because they're going to be in front of people. Oh, I'm going to be in front of people. And then we're going to be baptized. And it's going to scare. I don't want to be in front of people because I don't want to be about me. It's about God. And the thing is, it's, it is that. Like when you're in front of people and you're getting baptized, what you're saying is, I'm not good and I need Jesus. And that, I say this every time we baptize someone, that's the greatest message that I could ever preach. Because this person confesses that they were dead in their trespasses and sins and they needed Jesus. Gospel. Am I leaning on it? Number two, grow. <clears throat> There's a lot of G words, by the way. Uh, here, here's the question. Am I seeking to grow in the gospel through belonging to a church and practicing personal devotions? Am I seeking to grow in the gospel through belonging to a church and practicing personal devotions? We've developed these things ju just based on practical stuff. Like, there's a lot of people who, they, they, they are Christians, and yet they do not belong to a body of believers. And, and, and maybe that's you here today. And you're welcome in this body of believers. Like, we, you, you need each other. Writers all throughout the New Testament say over and over again, that, and really clearly in Hebrews 10.25, that we aren't supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Why? Because we need each other. I need you, and you need me. We need community. I need you to be in my life, and you need me to be in your life. And you're like, Jason, not that loud, but I do need you in my life. We need each other in each other's lives because we got to be encouraged because this life is really discouraging. Right? Because bosses are jerks. And maybe you're a boss. And here's the thing. You might be a jerk. <laughs> and the gospel helps you not be a jerk as a boss. And helps you not be a jerk as an employee. And we need each other. And personal devotion. So here's the thing. Sometimes reading the Bible is hard, right? Like, it's just hard. If you are having trouble reading the Bible, talk to me. I will be at the next step table, and I will help you find a plan to help you read the Bible. I will usually start with the book of John, because it is awesome. But I will, we will help you. You need personal devotions. And personal devotions at the very simplest levels are reading the, reading the Bible, praying. There it is. Number three, gifts. Am I actively using my gifts as a gospel creation? God's put stuff inside of you. Like, he, he's, he's, he's given you abilities and talents and stuff for you to do. Like, things that you're good at that no one else is good at. And then he's also spiritually gifted us when we become believers, empowered us to do things that we, that we wouldn't normally be able to do. Like, Leadership is a gift that the Lord has given me that I didn't, I didn't have before I came to know the Lord. 
teaching, preaching is a thing that, that developed for me, but that I was able to do after I came to know the Lord. And you start in infancy and you grow. And if you have trouble with this, you want to figure out how, we have a great resource uh, that helps you kind of get started in this, and it's uh, cityviewchurch.cc slash discover, and we help you kind of map out, okay, what, what's my spiritual gift? What's my personality? Because that's important too. Number four, here it is, good stewardship. Am I giving what God has given me to participate in the gospel? All right, so, so there's three parts of this, and, and I know we're running short on time. Sorry, uh, we're going to do it. There's time. Everybody is given the same amount of time. Time. You have time. I have time. We've got time. President of the United States, pastor of City View Church, Drew Crandall, my seven-year-old son, we all have the same number of hours. We've all got time. You need to steward that time well. If you're playing 40 hours of video games a week, you're not stewarding your time well. Okay? Just saying, get out of your, uh, I was told to stop using the Star Wars pajamas thing. So get out of your Mighty Morphin Power Rangers pajamas, guys, and go do something else. Okay? It, here, here's another one. And this is, ooh, this is going to be mean. Um, if you're spending hours pouring over your fantasy football stats, See, I went, from, I went from preaching to meddling at that point. That, that's like an old sentiment. Like, if you're spending hours doing that, you are not stewarding your time well. Because here, like, I'll get this, guys will come to me and say, hey, I'm really struggling, and I can't do my devotions. I just can't find time. But those are the guys who are winning the fantasy football league <laughs> and can tell you every stat about every person. And they're also the ones who know everything about the high school football team and the college football teams. Now, here's the thing. If you, there's nothing wrong with, with having a hobby that loves that stuff. No big deal. Do that. But you're, what you're doing is saying, I don't have time for Jesus. I have time for football. That's lunacy. And I'm going to do a fantasy football draft tomorrow, okay? <laughs> but I'm not going to spend hours on hours. It's just a game. It's for fun. For us, it's for fellowship, to spend time together. You're not serving your time well. Time. Talent. Everybody's got some talent. You got something you can do. Isabel over here takes pictures for us. Uh, she, she, she's taking some pictures. Coral's taking some pictures for us. They're on our website. You see them. David Morton, he's got a talent. He put together our website for us. Thank you, David Morton. It's, it's new and updated. Go check it out. Um, we, we take talents, and we use the talents. Use your talents for God. If you're not using your talents some way to serve the body of Christ, either this one or the broader body of Christ, then you need to. Like, that's what you're supposed to do. And then here, treasure. This is, where we, this is where we get real serious, like everything else up to this point. Even the fantasy football thing, no big deal. But now you're talking about my money? Yeah, we are. We are. Scripture teaches cheerful giving. Now, I'm, I would say, personally, the tithe started before the law. So before the law was given to Moses, tithing started. So I would say 10%. And really, Israelites would have lived in the 30% rage on their tithes, so we're really being nice. Tithe is 10. But if you're not giving at all to the local body, you're not stewarding that treasure that God's given you. This is not Jason trying to be fundraiser. This is Jason as a Christian who's experienced the goodness of God in giving. And what I've realized is that I can never outgive God. Is that no matter what, I can't outgive God. And I'll tell you how it's happened. We'll talk about it in terms of City View Church. 
the day, the week before, we let we uh, sent City View Alvin. The week before that, we had 118 or 20 people here. City View Alvin's here. We have 161 that day. Great day. Woo! Yeah, party. We got Killen's Barbecue. Everybody's here because you know they're eating great barbecue and we're doing something big. Yeah, great day. And then here's what I'm thinking as a person, as a pastor, as like, okay, well, we're just sending 25 of our greatest people, 25 leaders, great people with their kids. Okay, we're not going to get anywhere close to what we had on the 9th. Okay, well, instead, no, we had almost 140 on that. The Lord's in this. <laughs> we had almost 140 on the 23rd. So we go from... 118 over here to 140 over here. We gave away our best. We gave, and you guys are great too, but we gave away awesome people. <laughs> we said go. We said serve. We said go reach Alvin for the gospel. Get together. Learn your DNA. Go, go and serve. Go and be. Go and do. Do that. And we had more people. And the offering was bigger. And like we, we couldn't out, we can't out give God. Period. Now, it's not, hey, I'm going to, so it's not some magical formula. If I put $1,000 in, then this week I'm going to get $10,000 out. It doesn't happen like that. You be faithful. Be generous. Be joyful. Like, this is why we try to explain what we do with the money. Because we don't want you to think that, okay, well, I'm going to buy a plane. We're not buying a plane. We're, tr we're trying to send people to serve Jesus in the city. We're trying to make Pearland a permanent home for City View Pearland. And so giving is about us being gospel-centered here. And I'm not, so I'm not trying to get in your pocketbook and say, hey, give us your money. I'm trying to say, give God your money. Because it's better that way. He does better with your money than you do. Because you spend too much at Starbucks, Jason. And you buy cars that you can't afford and homes that you can't deal with. And you just want stuff because you just want stuff. God's better with, you, with your money than you are. Okay. Off that soapbox. Okay. Okay. And let me say, I'll say this real fast too. We always ask regular tenors and members to give because we want visitors to know, hey, you're welcome. You just come and check us out. We want you to know who we are. We want you to know what we're about. We don't expect you to give. But if you are finding your spiritual home, your community here, I'm not ashamed to say we, there's an expectation. If you go through our members class, you're going to hear it. Group, number five, group. Am I a part of a group that aids in my growth in the gospel? I, 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 we'll reference last week's message. You can go back and listen to that. I spent about 45 minutes on it. You need a group, period. You need people who know you. You can't show up on Sunday and expect you and me, me, everybody to know everything that's going on with you. You can't. Okay. Told you, reference last week. Number six, here it is, go. Am I actively seeking to share the gospel with others? Are you actively seeking to share the gospel with others? If you take your life and you rub them up against these six touchstones, you're going to see if you're living gospel-centered or not. Jason, that sounds painful. Yes, it will be painful. There will be, it will be hard because you will fall short. And then here's the thing. You look to Jesus. It's the same answer. You fall short in the way you live, you look to Jesus. You, 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 you fall short in, in these touchdowns, you look to you, touchdowns. Football's on the mind. <laughs> you fall short in these six touchdowns, you look to Jesus. It's about looking to Jesus. Jesus.